<laughs> and the good morning, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Horasis Extraordinary Meeting. This meeting is taking place, of course, in extraordinary times. Uh, we have no need to tell any of our viewers that. And obviously, that means that our leaders, business and political, are being tested. Um, maybe not tested like never before, but certainly tested more than they have been in modern times, perhaps even more so than during the depths of the global financial crisis. So we want to talk a little bit about how leaders can cope with this unprecedented uh, turn of events, and also what competitiveness means, how to make economies more competitive, companies more competitive, and how we can make perhaps a virtual circle between uh, good economic leadership and being competitive at the national and global um, and regional level. So I'm really delighted to present to you the speakers that we have. There are a few more that we hope will join us as we go along. Um, we have with us Marguerite Sodeman Rajnan, who is chairman of the executive board of Aeon Holden, large company that all of you will be familiar with. I'll also go ahead now and apologize to my panelists if I mispronounce your names. It's a it's a real weakness I have due to having an um, Alabamian accent. Um, so do forgive me. We have with us Diana Sabrain, who is co-founder of One Agrix. You may not be as familiar with this, but you, you might in the future. This is a B2B halal agribusiness company that is heavily focused on supply chain traceability, which is a topic that's been important for a while now and will become even more important as we go forward. And I think we'll talk a little bit about this. She's a big advocate for corporate social responsibility and sustainability. And we have with us, uh, joining from Brussels, Luca J. Hare president of the European Economic and Social Committee of the European Union, um, currently outnumbered on this, uh, as you mentioned, not so gender balanced panel, but we're kind of like it this way until some of the uh, other men might join them. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to talk a bit about um, leadership. Now, this can mean economic leadership in the first instance, but can also mean leadership in general. We are really counting on our leaders right now to help help recover, help help give us a way forward. Some are doing better than others, and we might, we might talk a little bit about that. I'd like to ask each of the panelists at this point just to give me your headline thoughts on our topic and tell me what do we need from leaders at this crucial time? And I'll turn first to Marguerite, if that's okay. Thank you, Cordy. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And especially in these unprecedented times, before they actually happened, it, we can already conclude that there was already an increasingly complex operating environment for both uh, uh, governments as well as uh, the private sector. Uh, just to mention a few, whether it's the gig economy, whether it's um, uh, regulatory circumstances, whether it's the cyber risks, etc. And all, to all of that, COVID-19 was actually added this year. Uh, what we see is that this, uh, talking about leadership, this requires um, uh, not only emotional intelligence or intelligence as such, IQ, but also the adaptability. You know, are you able to adapt to the changing circumstances? Uh, and that adaptability is extremely important at the moment in the leader. It requires, and we've seen it the past couple of months, it requires not only command and control, hard controls, but it also requires soft controls. It means that you need to take a look at, you know, are you empathic? In order to create trust, you need to be empathic. You need to show empathy. You need to have, you know, know what you're talking about, and you need to be authentic. Um, and for me, if I talk about leadership the past months, it's about, uh, as leaders, we need to take tough decisions. Our people want to be, and nevertheless, want to be heard. I want to be listened to and indeed also want to be led. But as leaders, we need to stand up, make the right decisions. Uh, and what's most important, uh, not only the goal is important to do the right things, but also doing things right, which means we need to communicate and communicate as much as possible to take everybody along on the journey. Thank you. And as a, as a business leader, are you satisfied with what you see from the political leadership? Ah, that's a very, that's a very bullseye question. Um, <laughs> To be honest, we've seen good examples and better examples. And uh, I think it's extremely important in this world, which is polarizing as we speak, to make sure that we are uh, focusing on the we instead of the I. 
And the we means that we need to take a look not only at the developed countries, but also the underdeveloped countries. How can we together overcome this crisis? Uh, we're living all together at this world. Uh, the vaccine has actually proven that there can be a crisis which is that fast, uh, with that speed, which is globally affecting everyone. And it's indeed made us uh, uh, not only being a health crisis, but we're at, we've ended up not only in an economic crisis, but also a social and humanitarian crisis. And the only way we can resolve this is by working together as public and private sector, in my opinion. Thank you. And as we discuss about political leadership, it's probably the right moment to bring in uh, the European Union here. Um, if, if we can hear uh, from your perspective, you, are you satisfied with what you're seeing at the leadership level? Um, and what do you think Europe's citizens need from their leaders at this moment in time? Well, thank you so much and a very warm uh, welcome and good morning to everybody. Although in this virtual uh, system as we are used, uh, we are a little fed up of this non-smart working way because it's everything but not smart what we are doing. We need also warm relationship uh, in being closer, but it's becoming more and more difficult. What I want to say is that uh, what we have seen in this unprecedented pandemic, at least from the European Union point of view, has been an unprecedented capacity of leadership. I want to say this very clear. And I want also to say that uh, in this, uh, as the the first speaker was saying, uh, I am very close to this concept of emotional intelligence. And the emotional intelligence, I have to recognize that is much more a female attitude than the male attitude. And from this point of view, we know very well that uh, the leaders that in Europe have leaded these responses in the pandemic have been much more female than men. And that also has, has made a difference uh, in, in this time. Uh, of course, the pandemic has radically changed much more than the financial crisis of 2008 or the security crisis since 2001, the international agenda. First of all, what we have uh, tested, the two words has become very high in all perception of European citizens. I think also world citizens, but European citizens absolutely are held at Europe. That's an unprecedented uh, Situation, health is not a priority, is not core business for European Union, but this has become the demand to take health, health security, health protection, health care, and health response as very, very high. And second, Europe, because there has been an unprecedented demand for Europe, even much more over of the competence, what Europe can be, can, can be active in doing, in doing things. And this has created unprecedented responses. I used to say very often that in Europe we, we think so much about the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan at the actual price is 1 trillion euro, uh, if you apply the price. And the Marshall Plan was American money to buy American product and to save Europe after the Second World War. Now, in six months, Europe, in se with several instruments and several decisions, has deblocked 7 trillion euro of European money to protect, to safeguard, to highlight the resilience of the system and to push investment to the future. Breaking uh, unprecedented taboo. Uh, we have suspended uh, the, the stability pact. We have put uh, enormous flexibility in the state aid rule. 2.4 trillion of authorization in state aid euro is something uh, completely unprecedented. There has been, for the very first time, now we're discussing about the next generation EU, the recovery plan, but the euro bonds, we are not calling them euro bonds, has already been established uh, in April when it was decided the sure mechanism. And the first mechanism of uh, uh, adding capital from the market uh, to intervene to protect the workers that has lost their work. So, unprecedented decision has been taken. And what has happened is also not only the unprecedented decision, the breaking taboos, but the fact that this has been taken in a very, very short time. It was only the uh, 13th of uh, March when Ursula von der Leyen announced for the very first time that Europe should have taken response to the crisis. Now we are in September. And everything has changed with an enormous convergence uh, at the political level, but also from the social and economic actor. There has been an enormous 
convergence of all interests is not done because now the real leadership is to make this happen is the what i call the triple i implementation 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 here you the employer's leader you know this is the, the real task because we can but the strategy has been decided as never has been done before yes in this today there is a eu summit and the leaders are still discussing about uh, very important details uh, rule of law the conditionality the rules but now the task is how to implement how the government will make the plan how they'll involve as rightly pointed out uh, also the private and this uh, private public partnership uh, to deal with the strategy for the future and we now need result because citizens demand result urgent result and not only urgent result but also capacity i think that the responsibility of leader to lead the long term perspective we have to use this crisis to change our future and we are in the condition to do not only for the impressive amount of money but also because we have started to rediscuss taboo and to plan other strategy and that's the situation where we are so there is an enormous need of leadership but i think that a lot of leader at least at european level has demonstrated their capacity i want only to point out and i close one issue when european union has established there are many but is world leadership in face of the crisis of the uh, world health organization completely blocked de facto europe take the leadership convoking a world summit for the vaccine uh, taking the, the the leadership of providing free access to vaccine to all the world has been europe to do what should have been done by the world health organization by the united nations system so this is where we are and so we all citizens employee organization uh, leaders of of multinational uh, employees organization and political leader the civil society to go in this direction europe has an enormous opportunity to change the line of the future for ourselves for our neighbor and i think also for the world thank thank you very much and this is a good um, i guess a passionate um call for the breaking of the taboos and highlighting actually that the disruption of the pandemic has uh, untold negative impacts but it can also be a, a reframing of priorities almost a scattering of the puzzle pieces and and the the key now is how do we put them back together and maybe make a better picture than we had before i'm really keen to hear and welcome to mr ayed we are we will bring you in in just a moment we're delighted to see you as we work on what in the world we have diana in singapore so you can give us a few interesting takes on this and perhaps react to what you've heard an asia perspective but you are also um running a, a global business and you're also um very active in um young young leadership initiatives and as a a young business person tell us what what you make of what you heard and what you would like to see from from the world leaders at this moment yes so uh, i would like to first say thank you very much it's a pleasure to come in here and discuss such a pertinent topic um amidst this covid-19 pandemic um i would like to begin by sharing a quote which would sum up my viewpoint of how the world can be it would be in a covid-19 world and a post covid one of the quote the quote goes something like this the world belongs to humanity not this leader that leader or that king or prince or religious leader world belongs to humanity by dalai lama and i think you know with with this i would like to begin that you know the, the topic of this conversation has been being competitive breeds economic leadership and i would like here to say that let's be collaborative let's um you know from what marguerite has said about collaboration about the world coming together and how about um when luca said about private public partnerships this is now the time where the world should now go into a global reset now we have seen the the current and current economic models not working at all um you know there's still equality um in in racial equality there's social un unrest so i mean all of this are all underlying um issues that we have seen in the current economic models but then covid-19 has made that more obvious has made that more you know in front of all our faces as global leaders that actually to be honest if we really dig deep 
politically and, and in the business sector, we need to do much more than that. And this is where also, you know, a very interesting time um, where with the COVID-19 pandemic, not only social unrest, we see um, economic crisis and we also see supply chain disruptions where, you know, there are bigger issues, food security issues. Um, how are we going to deal with whether on in a lockdown situation with COVID-19, if it's prolonged, how are countries who are export reliant going to survive? And um, how about food imports? Countries who really um, has food security, insecurity issues, how are we going to, you know, how is one country going to survive that and feed its citizens? So in that perspective also then comes an issue of the fourth industrial re revolution where it's, so we are in that situation right now globally where we are experiencing a total breakdown um, of, of systems and how can we actually gel and put the pieces together um, as you said, Courtney, uh, in a way, in, in my opinion, it would be a global reset. And then um, how can we leverage technology to, to, to into and put them into economic models where it serves not only um, the, the big corporations, but also the smallholder farmers. And I would speak in an agri-foods perspective, um, you know, because we are in the agri-food sector. And how do we help these small food and beverages manufacturers? Because economies are run by small medium businesses we cannot run away from that fact and and i will give you an example of the supply chain disruption what we have seen and why um, leadership is so so important leadership and communication is important now in a supply chain disruption that we've seen during COVID 19 in the food supply chain what we have seen is there's so much food wastage and and but there, at the same time there's also another side where there's not enough food so what do we see here is a distribution issue um, why? Because policymakers are in making decisions which are protectionist to one country, to each individual's country, because they want to. I mean, it's it's you know it's it's human nature, right? You would want to retain the food in your own country for your own citizens, but at the same time, are we thinking about the repercussions of economics? That's one, and the repercussions of socially, like what Lucas said. Are we also taking care of our neighbors? Kudos to European Union, right? Um, for and and the Commission for trying its best and going out there saying, okay, free vaccine to the world. But is this, I mean, I'm not criticizing. I'm just bringing it now back to, to, to execution. Is this, um, will, be, will this be able to be executed globally? Yes, and I think that points to a tension that exists that I think we can come back to in a few moments, which is the need and I suppose wish for uh, national leaders to protect their own and almost hunker down and and look after the interests first and foremost of their citizens but this is also a global crisis that requires global cooperation and and we're in a time of populism and and there had already been increasing protectionism and you know to to what extent does the crisis accelerate those those instincts um I would like to introduce to you now uh, more properly Jalul Ayed. He's the chairman of the MED Confederation and a former minister of finance of Tunisia. So um, welcome to you. And you can give us um, the perspective of a someone formerly involved in, in the national government and also, of course, a crucial perspective um, of leadership in an emerging country. Um, what is your take on what you've heard so far and what do you think is required of leaders at this moment? Thank you very much, uh, Courtney. I don't know if you're hearing me. I'm, I've been having some problems with the connection. We hear you now, yes. Can you? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, let me tell you how delighted I am uh, to take part in this uh, panel. There is no doubt that the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic has given rise to the biggest uh, sudden stops we have seen uh, in recorded history. Some consider it to be even stronger than, uh, than the Wall Street crash of 1929. However, there are two things that I think distinguish this uh, crisis. The first one <clears throat> is that the crisis uh, started in the real economy, Main Street basically, with the concomitant uh, gigantic drop uh, of uh, supply and demand, both globally and uh, domestically. Secondly, uh, uh, I should underline the, as the, astound uh, the astounding speed with which the crisis unfolded. For instance, uh, it took only a few weeks for unemployment uh, to rise 
to unprecedented level. We've seen that in the US, for example, where unemployment went up from 3.5% to 14% before uh, dropping to around 9% at present. With that being said, it is clear that emerging countries uh, are most at risk uh, to bear the brunt of this crisis for the following considerations. One, the weak health uh, systems in most emerging uh, economies, in uh, Tunisia, for example, which is considered um, a middle-income country, there are only 110 ICU beds. Uh, in some African countries, they don't even have a, a single ventilator. So that's a big problem. Two, most emerging economies have a limited fiscal space, which means that for many of them, it is uh, difficult to issue local currency uh, debt and of course, they can't tap the international capital markets under the prevailing conditions. Hence, a very limited capacity to raise liquidity and engage in fiscal uh, stimulus. Three, uh, also it is difficult, if not impossible, for most emerging uh, countries to do a quantitative easing similar to what we have seen in Europe and the United States because the central banks in these countries simply don't have the balance sheet that would allow them to uh, issue uh, uh, money the way we've seen in the United States, for example, where uh, they have injected about $3 trillion in a matter of weeks. Four, both export proceeds and workers' remittances have taken a deep dive. Uh, and for countries having a large uh, tourism sector, such as Tunisia, for example, the crisis is particularly damaging. In Tunisia, we have witnessed a 70% drop in tourism proceeds. Furthermore, this crisis comes at a time of rising concern for public debt sustainability. Most emerging countries uh, are low in, uh, for, on foreign exchange reserves, so it is very difficult for them to engage uh, on uh, swap or repo transactions similar to what we see, for example, in Indonesia, where they have swapped $60 billion with the Fed simply because uh, many of these countries simply don't have the level of uh, foreign exchange reserves and uh, treasury holdings that will allow them to do that. It is hence questionable whether many of them will be able to honor their foreign debt obligations, particularly after having borrowed very heavily in the international capital markets, taking advantage of the low interest rates over the last few years. It is therefore, and it's my opinion, it is uh, likely that many emerging countries will uh, engage in some forms of debt restructuring. So I wouldn't be surprised, personally, that uh, to see uh, crowds forming at the gates of officials and, uh, uh, and private creditors to seek uh, some form of debt relief or restructuring. As a result, sweeping international efforts are needed to help such countries to weather the storm. And in this regard, the role of the IMF uh, will be critical. Uh, they have announced that they will put aside $1 trillion to uh, uh, come to the rescue. But uh, there are serious questions uh, being posed as to what extent uh, the IMF and the World Bank can really play their role to the fullest amidst the fragility mm -hmm. of the multilateral system, uh, particularly uh, without the active support of the United States. Mm -hmm. For example, the real question is uh, whether the U.S. will support an expansion of uh, special drawing rights uh, uh, for the emerging markets or for the emerging countries. Fifth, we are witnessing some fundamental changes in the global supply chains. I think uh, Diana alluded to that earlier. Uh, what I should add, and also the international division of labor. It is feared like uh, the major transnational corporations will accelerate their uh, digital transition, leveraging such technologies such as AI and robotics. Um, and uh, will uh, possibly repatriate uh, some of their activities, some of their offshore activities back home. It's what we call reshoring phenomena, which I think will uh, is a major risk for some of our countries. In Tunisia, for example, the offshore sector employs 450,000 people. And really the, the question is, uh, if that phenomena were to be accelerated, uh, then there would be a real risk that Tunisia would be taken. So these are some of the um, major impacts that I see, but there are some other, I mean, um, impacts. If you give me some time, I can go through them or, or I can, uh, I mean, I can cover them later on. We'll, we'll, we'll come, come back to them because what I think you're 
highlighting that's really important that we tackle is that that you know there is the prospect of a real development crisis and you know we were already on track to miss achievement of the UN sustainable development goals for example and the crisis surely sets them back by a long way including goal um the important goal number one of, of poverty and the particular um, vulnerabilities that developing countries have points to the need for a joined up approach and they will need um, support from from developed economies, from multilateral institutions. Um, so what I want us all to address if we can um, is the issue of global cooperation. And I mentioned about there have been a lot of winds blowing already of populism and protectionism. Um, how do we guard against those? Uh, how can leaders um, really make sure that we have a system of global cooperation and a global approach to the crisis? And I'd like to ask Marguerite again as a, you know, um, as a as a key leader in a in a global company, um, how how can we take this joined up approach when when there is also a need to look after you know individual um, employees and citizens first? Yeah, so um, it's a balancing act, Courtney. And I think what's 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 important to notice is that um, uh, back to the developing countries. If you take a look at the emerging countries uh, and back to how we can help each other, we've also seen that, um, especially, you know, if you look, take a look at GDP, GDP is mainly actually uh, uh, formed by the contribution of small, medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. If you take a look in, 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 in the smaller countries, in, in the, uh, but also in the developing countries in, in Africa, we see that uh, especially women and female entrepreneurs have also suffered from the crisis the past mm -hmm. months. Uh, it's been found out that 25% uh, less uh, access there is for females uh, to, to the internet or to phones. So how can we help? And this is, you know, if you take a look at GDP contractions, I'm not sure how much it was in Tunisia, but we've seen contractions like 35, 40% in some quarters now, and it's, it's, it's serious. Mm -hmm. And how can we help as public and private sector is to take a look at um, how can we work in partnerships uh, to tackle the problem, how can we indeed uh, provide um, uh, financial tools or products uh, to those free entrepreneurs, for example, um, uh, to help them continue their business to be able to pay bills and to get paid. Uh, very simple things. Mm -hmm. The other element I would like to add, so that's a digital uh, uh, evolution, also in other countries than the developing mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. For that, there is also the other part is also that um, it's important to make sure that the discussions are being held uh, not only for your own country, uh, but also for the rest of the world. And especially if you take a look at the vaccinations, how we've been looking also as Europe to help uh, 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 regions like Africa. I think it's important to make sure and to understand it's a global crisis. And, and of course, there will be local measures which mm -hmm. depend on local circumstances. Uh, but some of the uh, discussions should take place at the global or European level or African level, but in the collaborative level to make sure we find solutions. Uh, and it's not easy. No, not at all. I, I'm curious what, um, if we can bring um, Luca back in, what, uh, what is the European Union able and prepared to do to try to assist developing countries, including in nearby neighbors like like Tunisia, to deal with some of the problems um, that Joel has highlighted for us? Yes, you are very right. Uh, here we have a, dou a double point that has to be underlined. I think that Europe uh, is at least trying to do its best. Uh, and in this case, I am very proud to be a European uh, and uh, to have some role to, to play in this institution. The first, uh, we have to, to, to look to issue that has started long before this pandemic crisis. Because, of course, the pandemic has exploded uh, an unprecedented situation of crisis and unemployment, as was uh, rightly pointed out, the crisis in SMEs uh, all around the world, and also in Europe. We have sector that has been uh, are going to bankruptcy with more than 80 percent. All the sector of travel, tourism, is practically locked down since months, and will create a destroying of enterprise that will stay for a very long time. So, but there are trends, and the two main trends that were there are one. In the international system, from the last 10 years, we have definitely passed from a long period of 
cooperative competition, if I can say, huh? to a system of disruptive conflict. Mm -hmm. Look to the trade, look to the, uh, to the war, look to Europe. 15 years ago, was surrounded by peace. Russia was part of the NATO with the Americans and the United States. We are the best friends. Now Trump defined Europeans as the best enemies. The South Mediterranean was complete in peace. With China, there was a looking of a new range of, of cooperation. Now they have been uh, defined uh, the systemic uh, rival. So here the, the world has radically changed in this. And these trends is even accelerated during, during the pandemic. And from this point of view, as I was saying first, uh, with, uh, with the vaccine, but it's not only with the vaccine, the, the answer from Europe that has been raising and improving for what was possible, the level of cooperation uh, since the very first weeks, uh, not only vaccine measure has been taken for Europe, but, but measure has been taken either for Africa and the Mediterranean countries, either for the refugees. So Europe has established that this concept cannot be disrupted because we have to resist. We cannot live in a world when we are surrounded by explosion, by disruption. This concept remains very high. The second one is what was already clear in the last 10 years, that we have to go very, very far and very fast beyond GDP measure. We have to go towards a system of well-being system of measuring and targeting. We have called it the Sustainable Development Agenda, the Green Deal, the New Revolution. Now we also are calling for the new industrial and strategic sovereignty. Europe is a completely new concept in key industrial sector, but also in the digital one. This changed the parameters, but this is a long-term strategy where, for example, there could be an enormous alliance with the South of the Mediterranean and with all Africa. And I think that this strategy that von der Leyen put, don't forget the two first act of Ursula von der Leyen, when she was appointed as definitely as president of the commission in last December, was first she went to the parliament to announce the Green Deal agenda from the commission. And one week after, she went first in the history, one week after, two weeks after she was appointed in Addis Abeba with all the college, the commissioner to meet the African Union commissioner to establish very high the agenda. It is not a question of compassion. Eh? I want to be very clear here. It's a question to look at Africa as a strategic partner for the long term future. It's true that today Africa represents uh, less than 2% of the world trade, so it's nothing. But Africa will double its population with more than 17% of its population with less of 30, 35 years old. And Africa has decided in the last year to establish a new African continental free trade agreement that has been entering into force during the pandemic. The Secretary General has been established during the pandemic. The building of the African internal market could be the game changer for this continent as it has been for Europe to the internal market. So an alliance between the European internal market and the African internal market replacing the colonization of China or the entering, uh, destroying from the United States could be the drive changer of the recyclical future and for the world. And Europe has this very clear, is continuing to go in this direction. There are work, uh, okay, there will be perhaps a little postponed during the Portuguese presidency, what's scheduled to be during the German presidency, but the EU-Africa summit. So this strategy is very clear. Mm -hmm. And for the lead to that is in my capacity, because I am not the leader of the European Union, I am the chair of one of the institutions. Yesterday, I signed with the Union for Mediterranean a new memorandum of understanding to reinforce the civil and the economic and social pillar of this Barcelona process. So we have to work on both to the short term to protect people, enterprise, society, community for the enormous impact of crime that is enormous can push us in the worst recession ever with all the consequences we know. But on the other, we have to continue to reinforce and to improve the long-term drive of change and of strategy. There are, of course, partnership at a level in a, in a world dimension. Thank you very much. And I want to um, get Jalul's reaction to that in just a moment. But I want to ask Diana 
because I know that some of these things are probably music to your ears um, in terms of um, looking for new economic models that are perhaps fairer, more sustainable. Um, but we've talked a bit already about SMEs and the support that's needed. Um, and you can give us some firsthand um, experience there on whether you feel that that SMEs are getting um, what they need and mm -hmm. also what are the implications of perhaps this new economic model that might arise from the crisis. Yes, so I would like to, to touch upon what Luca has said about Africa being the continent, which is a game changer, that's true. In fact, one at Greeks, we had the privilege to have a strategic partnership with International Trade Center, which is a United Nations and World Trade Organization's mandate. And the, the mandate was for One Agrix to empower and uplift the African smallholder farmers and SMEs and to help them use um, and leverage technology to global trade. And then obviously COVID-19 happened, uh, right? This strategic agreement was last year. Um, and, and I had the, the, uh, the privilege to be at African Union Commission in Ethiopia last year. I spoke firsthand with smallholder farmers, farming farming unions, farmers unions, so, sorry, apologies, um, speak with um, people like government all the way to uh, downstream stakeholders. And that I could see um, really a, a very cohesive and collaborative, um, you know, like what Lucas said, a, a very private partnership um, process there, partnership, um, you know, uh, agreement going on between different, different stakeholders in, in the ecosystem. So then I would like to say that, you know, in terms of SMEs, what we hear always is the disconnect between government policymakers and what they know. Um, and this is also in Singapore, in Asia, in ASEAN, where we see that there's a disconnect in communication. And, and, and you must be thinking, okay, but you know, governments, we communicate, but then the language becomes an issue. It becomes too technical. Can the layman, can SMEs understand? And this is where this, and, and you know, we, you can say there's AFC, FTA, right? There is um, whatever free trade agreements out there. But if your citizens are not understanding, um, e even seasoned businessmen are not are very confused with the, the numerous free trade agreements. So I, I think that there needs to be work in a communication perspective. And I would like to give a great example. So I, um, last year when I was at um, speaking on the Horasis plenary, we were speaking about ASEAN. And uh, the Myanmar minister said how... Singapore is seen as a first world country, as a developed country, whereas Myanmar and our neighboring countries are emerging countries. And, you know, it was put, uh, the, the, you know, it was put on me um, saying that Singapore needs to help others more, that we need to help, um, you know, communicate more with the youths, our youths communicate with their youths. And at that moment, I was like, oh gosh, okay, we, we, we are not communicating properly. Um, apparently, we are seen so comfortable in our own, you know, in our own bubble. And this is where, you know, I think, in Africa, between Africa and Europe, it's the same thing, right? Um, if you talk about agricultural sector, you, European agricultural sector is developed. They have state-of-the-art technology. How can you communicate and share, knowledge share that to Africa, help Africa uplift itself? And um, so, so that technology is, is the key, is the key driver here. And the, the main thing that we have seen, um, because we also work with um, big corporations as well, not only the smallholder farmers, uh, we've seen that they are afraid of technology in general. People see technology as disruptive more than um, as a tool to empower. And, um, I, and I think, uh, again, it stems to the understanding, you know, that technology will not give you jobs, that big corporates will then rely so much on automation and then what, ha what happened to jobs. But at the same time, I think there's upskilling that is needed. You know, COVID-19, since this global reset, how can policymakers make it affordable for everyone to improve themselves. In Singapore, we do have some, something called the skills credit where, you know, we can use credits. Um, we are given like $1,500 or $1,000 to upgrade our skills, which um, is towards the fourth industri industrial revolution. So th this is, this is um, my point of view. Thank you. And I think it, what it um, amounts to is I think the need for um, not just communication, but education, education on what it is we're talking about. And, and trade itself is a very complex topic with, yes. um, with a bit of a soup of, of acronyms, but also education for the upskilling of the workers to prepare them for the post-crisis world. Uh, we have a few minutes left, but we've been talking about Africa 
Um, <laughs> the, the sort of potential crisis there, some of the problems that you already highlighted for us, but what some of the policy reactions could be. Um, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear the North African perspective on this, um, it, it, are you getting the support that's needed and, and, and what more can be done? Thank you. Um, first, let me go back to the uh, SMEs. We, we, we should say MSMEs because we should be talking about the micro enterprises first and foremost, because in countries in the emerging markets, uh, the micro enterprises uh, represent the bulk, uh, the lion's share of the economic fabric in these countries. And what we've seen in this crisis is that the lockdown has had a dreadful impact uh, on those MSMEs, particularly in the informal sector. Mm -hmm. And that's another aspect which really should be underlined. Um, most of the macro enterprises operate in the informal sector. And here we're talking about people who would work day in and day out to simply uh, provide food for their families and who can't even take advantage of some of the feeble financial and uh, social support schemes that uh, that uh, some of the governments, like the Tunisian governments, have put in place for the simple reason uh, that the transmission mechanisms are hardly actionable in the informal economy. And that's a big, big point that I really would like to emphasize. Hence the importance, the importance to... Uh, to emphasize the need to formalize, uh, to at least attempt to formalize uh, the informal sector, which in our economies represents between 40 to 60 percent in Africa and and uh, um, and Latin America. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is uh, that uh, basically uh, what. Uh, uh, it should be emphasized that the pandemic has affected poor people all over the globe, uh, in both emerging markets and in advanced countries. That's also, I think, uh, a point worth uh, mentioning. We have seen long food lines in the USA. We have also witnessed the, the perverse impact of the pandemic on migrant workers in the UAE, for example, and other countries, as well as on the illegal immigrants in Europe. So net net, the pandemic had uh, revealed in broad daylight the ugly face of poverty all over the world mm -hmm. and inequality as well. Uh, and uh, therefore, we hope to see uh, that um, that uh, that accelerated actions uh, to tackle such issues. Uh, they. Um, in my opinion, uh, should be uh, reinforced and uh, uh, reinforced tremendously because this crisis has really shown the ugly face of poverty all over the world. Mm -hmm. That's what I have to tell that. Thank you. And I think that's a very uh, cogent point, which is, you know, the crisis, as you say, has shown a, a bright light on, in a way, the, the worst of the world and our biggest and most pressing problems. It's made some of them worse. But in this bright light, it allows us to see them very clearly and therefore hopefully to tackle them, which is which is not easy. It's the task of of the leaders of companies, both small and large, of of national governments, uh, of of uh, local, state, regional and international, intra regional um, and also business leaders. So I think we've had a pretty good representation um of each of these um constituent parts um so I, I would like to thank you all for tuning in i would like to uh thanks most of all to our panelists for taking the time um uh, joining us from your particular jurisdictions your particular um time zones there's always much more that we could discuss on a topic such as this one it's almost way too much to tackle um in in 45 minutes uh, we have uh, two minutes left which i'd like to give uh to bring it full circle back to marguerite um and are you encouraged by what you are hearing here from your your colleagues um in other sectors and and other geographies and other areas of responsibility yeah so i think for me courtney and thank you very much luca and uh, uh, jello for your and diana for your remarks i think it's about leadership 
diversity and more and most foremost collaboration. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that it's important for leaders now to be modest, to be curious, and to be willing to learn, because that's the, those are the key skills and capabilities with which you will able be able to engage with others. And for me, that's very important this time. If we're all able to be willing to listen, to be willing to learn, and to be curious, uh, then at least we are having an interest into each other. And I have to say, Luca, I was so impressed by your, um, by your outburst for Europe, because I do feel this is a time for us to stand up together with the African Union and, and help each other and make sure that, you know, not only Africa and Europe, but also the whole world gets stronger. So thank you for that. Thank you. That's a, a great way to end the session. Thanks again to our excellent uh, speakers here, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.